Ladies and gentlemen, to introduce our next speaker, I would like to invite dear friend and ZTFE stalwart, Dorab Mystery. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning to you. It is a great, great privilege to introduce a gentleman to you who needs no introduction, Lord Karan Bilimoria from the United Kingdom, who has come all the way here just for the day. He arrived last night at midnight and leaves this evening, come here to address the 12th World Zoroastrian Congress. His bio data is extensive, and I will leave it to you to read his bio data, which is in the program brochure. But I think I should emphasize three things about his life, which are quite remarkable. Karan comes from a very distinguished military family in India. His father was a lieutenant general. He is related to all the Parsi service chiefs. And yet, he came to England to do a chartered accountancy at EY. After that, he went to Cambridge and did a law degree. So he could have had a very cushy, lucrative life and career as partner in a law firm, partner in a firm of chartered accountants, but he chose neither. And he went into business. Karan is the quintessential icon of what entrepreneurship means. His first business was to import polo sticks. I always tease him and say he's of royal background. <laughs> Importing polo sticks from Rajasthan to England. That business was not so successful. Polo is a declining game in the UK. His second business was to import Nag Chap beer. Nag Chap is Cobra. And he was wise enough to buy the brand and keep the brand in his hands. And gradually, by sheer determination, hard work, innovation, enterprise, he built the company Cobra Beer, got it made in the UK, and became its owner, brand ambassador, chief executive, and where he is today. In 2006, Prime Minister Tony Blair appointed the first Parsi Zoroastrian elevated him to the House of Lords. And I remember <laughs> the Speaker of the House of Lords sent an SOS saying he wanted a copy of the Parsi prayer book. Why? Because the new Lord insists on swearing by his own prayer book. <laughs> that is the first thing about Karan, his entrepreneurship. Second was that Karan knows no barriers, no glass ceiling. And he has gone from strength to strength to the extent that this year he was the first non-white president of the Confederation of British Industry, the most prestigious business organization in the UK. <laughs> Ten years ago, when Her Majesty celebrated her Diamond Jubilee, there was a boat pageant down the river Thames, and Her Majesty went in her own royal boat down the Thames. Now, the custom in England is that when the royals depart the soil of the United Kingdom, they are seen off by a deputy lord lieutenant. And do you know, since she was taking a boat from Richmond Pier, the deputy lord lieutenant of Richmond and Chelsea received her and saw her off. And do you know who that was? That was Lord Curran Billimoria. <laughs> and his third, and in my opinion, most endearing quality is that his doors and his heart are always open to Parsi, Zoroastrians, wherever they are. And we in the Zoroastrian Trust Funds of Europe are so proud and so grateful to him. And every royal endorsement that we have had, the great visit of Prince, the late Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh to the Zoroastrian Center in 2011 would not have been possible without Karan's strong support. You had an interfaith panel here on the first day. One of the great interfaith leaders of the UK once mentioned and said, 
the Zoroastrians have only one member of the House of Lords. We Hindus have about 30. But you know that one fellow is like a cricket team. He looks after 11 people. So with those words, ladies and gentlemen, I am indeed deeply honored to present you his most noble lord, Billamoria of Chelsea. Thank you for that far too kind welcome, and it's such a pleasure for me to be with all of you here. Uh, it, it, it means a great deal. Uh, the last time I addressed this Congress was in Mumbai, in Bombay, in 2013, and it's a, an event I'll always remember. And I'm walking in Vada Dasuji was here, and of course he, he opened the Congress there. Uh, I'm going to be speaking for about half an hour and sharing some of my thoughts and reflections, particularly with what Dorab has just said of being the president of the CBI, the Confederation of British Industry, for the past two years. I want to take you back to 2017 January. Um, I attended the Harvard Business School through executive education uh, for 16 years. I became an alumnus after nine years and I went back for refreshers. And one of these weeks that I spent at the beginning of January 2017, Professor Ravi Abdullal gave us a talk about the two major incidents that had happened globally in 2016. And what were they? One was Britain voted to leave the European Union in June, Brexit. And the second was the election of President Donald Trump um, here in the United States. And he compared the two. And the fault lines were identical. Pro-Brexit and pro-Trump were identical, whether it was immigration, whether it was education, whether it was rural, urban, and he took us through all this. And he ended the lecture with a graph that he put up on the screen that will lay imprinted on my memory forever. That graph started after the Battle of Waterloo in 1815. Apologies to anyone from France over here. And it was about, this graph was about globalization. 1815, big war, Duke of Wellington won with the support of allies, including Marshal Blucher of Germany and the Dutch. Well, and Napoleon lost. Globalization took off from 1815 onwards. Through the whole of the 19th century, remember, America grew as a country in power. Britain's empire grew, the European empires grew, globalization and trade absolutely flourished. 1900, early 1900s, the graph peaked. And then the First World War took place. A war that should never have happened. There's an author, I can't remember her name, who wrote a book about the build-up of the First World War and said it was like watching a train clash in slow motion. And that wretched war lasted for four years, from 1914 to 1918. Of course, globalization plummeted right back down. It picked up a bit in between the First and Second World Wars, and of course, the Second World War was caused by the First World War. Globalization plummeted again. And then, after the Second World War finished, in 1945, the graph continued and continued and continued until January 2017, when it had surpassed the peak in the early 1900s. And he said, you tell me now what's going to happen next if history repeats itself. We will have conflict. Well, that was five years ago, and he was absolutely right. Today, we live in an age defined less by globalization than by uncertainty, by rising protectionism, and by international instability. So when I was appointed the Vice President of the CBI, President-elect in 2019, June, um, it's a two-year tenure, so it lasted from 2020 to 2022, June. And as Zorab has said to you, the CBI is by far the most preeminent business organization in the UK. It covers every part of the UK, Northern Ireland, Scotland, Wales, England, and it is international. 
Washington, Brussels, Delhi, Beijing. And it covers all sectors of the economy, everything from agriculture to lawyers and accountants uh, to the big FTSE 100, FTSE 250 companies. And all the trade associations, the major tra trade associations like the National Farmers Union, uh, uh, for example. So CBI is sometimes referred to as a lobbying organization, lobbying on behalf of business to government. And we have access to government from the prime minister to the finance minister across the board. But I hate that term. I like to see ourselves as being at the sharp end of business and being able to lead the way, not to go to, business, to government with a begging bowl, but to go to government with us as entrepreneurs and businesses. Quite often, we spot the problem way before government does. We spot the solution before government has even seen the problem. And most importantly, we want to act, and we want to act quickly. Problem, solution, action. That's been my mantra, and that's quite frankly the essence of what entrepreneurship is all about. Well, I was the first president of the CBI in its history to be an entrepreneur. Usually they're over 70 years old, gray-haired, FTSE 100, white male chairman of FTSE 100 companies. I was first relatively younger. I was the first active, sitting, crossbench member of the House of Lords. And I was the first ethnic minority CBI in its history. Not just ethnic minority, from the tiniest ethnic minority community in the world, the Zoroastrian Parsis. <laughs> and you know, when they say, what, Zoroastrian Parsi? I have to say, Freddie Mercury. Oh, yes, ah, yes. Yeah. And then I say, oh, and then, you know, Tatars, they own Jaguar Land Rover, they own Tata Sea. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And oh, you've had some vaccinations, Serum Institute of India. Oh, yes, yes, Punawalas. And what about Cobra Beer? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Okay, so. So I made a few priorities. One of them was to champion ethnic minority participation across all business in the United Kingdom. And in the United Kingdom, our ethnic minority population is about 15% of our population. I wanted to champion it. And I started a new initiative called Change the Race Ratio. And I've had over 100 of the leading companies in the UK, from Microsoft to Deloitte, uh, you name it, they've all joined up. And my priorities were also to promote entrepreneurship, to promote universities and businesses working more closely together, uh, particularly with regard to research and development and innovation, and of course to promote global Britain. But at that time, did I see the pandemic coming, the worst global crisis since the Second World War? Never, never. And in fact, while I was still vice president in March 2020, we announced our first lockdown. March 23rd was our first lockdown. And I remember, I was one of the early adopters. I got COVID early. So, so I was in bed, and there was a CBI board meeting, and I, was, I don't stop working. So I was working through while I had COVID in bed on the phone. And this was just pre-Zoom days. It was still doing conference calls. And the director general of the CBI said, Karen, you've nearly lost your business a few times. You've been through tough times. The economy is shutting down. What advice would you give us? I said, you know what advice I give you? I can see it clearly in front of my eyes. Lockdown means businesses are shut. Many businesses cannot operate. My customers, Cobra Beer, 7,000 restaurants will be shut. They will not have any customers. They will run out of cash. They'll want to go to their banks to borrow the money, and it's difficult enough getting money from a bank in normal times. In uncertain times, the banks will not lend. And if the government guarantees the loans, they guarantee them 80%, the banks will not be willing to take even a 20% exposure even that won't work. The only thing that will work is if the government guarantees those loans 100%. And they laughed at me. I said, I'm sorry, you want, you want my opinion? That's what we need to do. And I persisted at every opportunity in the House of Lords, in speeches. I said, we need 100% government guaranteed loans. 
Switzerland and Germany started doing 100% government guaranteed loans. I was on a major television BBC program uh, in the UK called Question Time, and there was a cabinet minister, and I challenged him there. I said, the money is not flowing through. Businesses are going to go bust. Lend and guarantee those loans 100%. And the following week, they agreed to do it, and we got 100% government guaranteed loans. <laughs> I've met so many SMEs who've taken out these loans since and said, thank you, you saved our businesses. 1.6 million businesses in the UK took out these loans. So the message there is, as entrepreneurs, there is one word that sums us up. We have guts. We have the guts to do it in the first place, but we have the guts to keep going when others would give up. So Dora uh, mentioned about Cobra Beer. Um, I learned my lessons building up this brand of beer from scratch, from nothing, with 20,000 pounds of student debt in my pocket. Um, no money. I mean, people say, I had five pounds in my pocket when I came to the UK. I had 20,000 pounds of debt when I finished my studies. And I raised all the money, built up the brand from scratch. And, uh, and it was very simple. You spot a gap in the market. I wanted a beer that was, I hated fizzy lagers. I loved smooth ale. I wanted a beer that tasted in between a lager and an ale, and a beer that would accompany all food because I saw Indian food was getting more and more popular in, in the UK and around the world. And so brewed smooth for all food is our slogan, and that's what it does. But it was difficult to create it. I created it from scratch, and that is the essence of Cobra beer. Uh, passionate about something, hating something, um, seeing something you don't like and saying, I can do this better, I can do this differently, I can change the marketplace forever. And um, today, I, I'm going to boast, please forgive me. At, 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 at Harvard Business School, in one of the classes, they said, be confident, but not arrogant. <laughs> be ambitious, but be humble. Be humbitious. So if I boast, I say it humbitiously. 137 gold medals, and we're a household name in the UK. In fact, In fact, I, I would go so far as to say we're the most famous Indian brand, household name-wise, in the UK, and I'm very, very proud of that. Um, I'm proud, as you uh, heard, to be in Parliament, and of course I'm following in the footsteps of the great uh, Dada Bhai Naroji in 1892, Manchuji Bhanagri in 1895, Shapuji Sakladwala of the Tata family in 1922. It's a centenary of his election to Parliament. And one was a liberal, one was a conservative, one was Labour, and I become the first Lord, and I'm an independent crossbench peer. Only the Parsis could do that, squaring the circle. <laughs> and I've now been in the House of Lords for 16 years. And when I joined, I was the third youngest peer in the House. I'm still one of the younger peers in the House. The average age is 70. <laughs> so, um, uh, but I'm proud. I'm proud to be the first Zoroastrian uh, member of the House of Lords, and Dorab mentioned about the prayer book, which sits in the dispatch box every single day in the House of Lords that we sit. And that prayer book I've used time and again every time there's an election we and the new government is formed, we have to swear our oath of allegiance to the Queen. And it's not going to be just me, there will be more Zoroastrian Parsi peers in the House of Lords in the years to come. <laughs> I've just been lucky to have the opportunity to pave the way, that's all. Uh, so I'm delighted to participate in the 12th World Zoroastrian Congress. Um, I, I, I would like to thank and congratulate um, the Zoroastrian Association of Greater New York and the Federation of Zoroastrian Associations of North America. Uh, thank you for all the work that you put in. It is no mean feat to get together over a thousand people from all over the world. All the effort that, that takes to, to Arzan, to Keki, to Aban, to Astad, to all of you involved, many, many thanks and many congratulations. And it's also a, a huge privilege for me to uh, speak to you today after my, my friend, Justice Rowanton Nariman, opened the Congress for you, somebody I've respected enormously, one of the brightest people on this planet. So great, Rowanton, to have you here. Um, I also want to pay tribute to Dorab Mystery, to Rusi Dalal, who's here. Rusi, he is amazing. He just never stops. I tell you, the support that Dorab, that Rusi, that Malcolm Debu 
um, our president of the Zoroastrian Trust Funds of Europe, uh, Shenaz Engineer, who's the head of the Zora World Zoroastrian Chamber of Commerce. I was the first president. She has run it since then amazingly well. These are our stalwarts, and I'm, I'm so grateful. And the Mark Your Diaries, the two events in the, which the Zoroastrian Trust Funds of Europe are hosting next year in July, um, the 8th World Zoroastrian Youth Congress from the 21st to the 26th of July at the Radisson Blue Edwardian near Heathrow, and we'll have events at the Zartoshi Brothers Hall and at the Zoroastrian Centre in Harrow, London. And then we're going to have the World Zoroastrian um, Co World Conclave, the WZCC World Conclave, to be hold by, hosted by the WZCC UK chapter from the 25th to 29th of July next year. And we will be able to we'll show you around London, and I will also host you in the House of Lords. So look forward to having you all there. It is now, somebody sent me an email some years ago after I became a member of the House of Lords and said, why don't you start a Zoroastrian all-party parliamentary group? <laughs> and I did. And that was started nearly a decade ago before the last Congress in 2013, which I continue to chair the ZTFE at the Secretariat. And I'll tell you something, on the 800th anniversary of the Magna Carta, in 2015, I held a special event to compare Magna Carta with Cyrus' Cylinder of 530 BC. We had the curator of Cyrus' Cylinder from the British Museum come to Parliament, and we had an expert on the Magna Carta and King John. And do you know what? Very simple, the message that came out of that meeting. One, Magna Carta is pretty modern. It's only 800 years old. Our human rights is 2,500 years old. So. The, the next, next message that came across very clearly was that King John was a bad king. He tried to renege on the Magna Carta the day after he signed it, after it was sealed, um, whereas Cyrus the Great was genuinely magnanimous. Um, it is estimated during his rule, during the Akhamitic Empire, uh, by 480 BC, the Persian Empire covered about almost half of humanity. And the best thing about him is that he not just protected the people in his empire, but he promoted, allowed them to practice their religions, for faiths to flourish. Um, and it was absolutely amazing. I mean, my, many of my friends in the UK, my close Jewish friends, they remind me about the Old Testament um, and the Torah and, and a passage from the book of Ezra where it says, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he had charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. And he allowed the Jewish people to go back to their homeland, something that they remember and are grateful to for right to this day. And my, my wife, Heather, is South African. And um, I, I have had the privilege of, of, of hearing Mel Nelson Mandela uh, speak. And you know, he, when he was at Robben Island, he would often recite the poem Invictus. And uh, that poem ends with the words, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. And the reason I'm telling you that is that many other faiths, whether it's the Abrahamic, Catholicism, Anglican, they, they put great emphasis on forgiveness of sins. Um, you know, in the prayer, Lord's Prayer, forgive me, for, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. But in Zoroastrianism, um, there is much more of an emphasis on action, action in this life, quite apart from preparing ourselves for judgment in the next. And I think that has had a big influence on all of us in how this little community achieves so much, way beyond its numbers. And the Gathas, the Gathas spoke, speak about the divine sparks, about good purpose, righteousness, desirable dominion, holy devotion, wholeness, immortality. Um, all this, you come together, and I make another comparison with South Africa. There's an African word, Ubuntu. Uh, and Nelson Mandela used to talk about Ubuntu. And he said, the question, therefore, is, are you going to do so to enrich yourself in order to enable the community around you to be able to improve? Ubuntu is about human nature, it's about humility, it's about human kindness, and it's about community. That describes our community to me very, very clearly. We demonstrate that every single day. But none of our achievements would be possible 
without the host countries enabling us to do what we do, to start with India, who welcomed the Zoroastrians over a thousand years ago. <laughs> this country, the United Kingdom, they've all enabled us to flourish, and we should be grateful. And my friend, the Nobel laureate Amartya Sen, has written at length about identity. He's now a professor at Harvard, and he was master of Trinity College at Cambridge when I knew him. Um, and he says we have multiple identities, each one of us. We all come from different parts of the world. In my case, I'm proud to be Indian. I'm proud to be an Asian living in British. I'm proud to be British. And I'm proud to be a Zoroastrian. So I'm very clear about my identity, of which Zoroastrianism is a really, really important part of it. When the pandemic started, in fact, it was while I was still in bed in March 2020, I received a message from Professor John Quelch, who taught me at Harvard Business School, was head of the London Business School, and is currently the head of the Miami Business School. And he said, here are the seven C's for surviving in a crisis. One, calmness, confidence, communication, collaboration, community, compassion, and cash. And he was spot on. And if I tell you, I gave you an example about these loan guarantee schemes and how they worked. There's an example of, about cash. Collaboration. Do you know Prime Minister Boris Johnson, now let's not talk about him in too much detail because it'll take a long time, but he has done some good, really good things. Um, and one of the best things he did was in the pandemic when it started in May 2020, he appointed a private sector individual, Kate Bingham, who's now Dame Kate Bingham, to head the vaccine task force. He said to her, you're empowered, you've got a direct line to me, go there, back vaccines, finance vaccines, order vaccines, so we can be first off the mark, get the regulators to approve them quickly. And do you know what? She backed six vaccines, and our first vaccination was on December the 8th, 2020. Now, that would never have happened if he'd left it to the government, the National Health Service, brilliant though it is, on its own. It only happened because a private sector came in working with government and working with universities. And of course, one of the first two vaccines was the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine developed by Oxford University in collaboration with AstraZeneca headquartered in Cambridge, a British-Swedish company headquartered in Cambridge. And I take it one step further. It only really happened because the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine chose to collaborate with the Serum Institute of India, who at that time were the biggest vaccine manufacturers in the world. And they have now produced two billion doses of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. So the collaboration is a very, very important point uh, that was key. Communication. If I could give you an example about communication. In August last year, no, August 2020, just six months after the pandemic had started, less than six months, I got to hear from the United States of lateral flow tests, which we all know about now, these instant lateral flow tests, we do them ourselves. At that time, PCR test was the only test that was accepted. I said to the government, look, these tests are cheap, they're quick, we can get people to use them, test on their own. If they're negative, they carry on work in school and university. If, they, if they're positive, they isolate. Everyone else carries on with their daily life. Not this one person test positive, a whole bubble has to isolate. They would not listen. And I persisted in Parliament, and I persisted in my speeches, and I persisted every opportunity. They would make fun of me. They would bat me away. You look up Hansard, November the 12th, 2020. I asked the question again. The health minister said, Lord Bellamoria, you have totally won this argument, and we are inspired by you. <laughs> you know, they then listened. Remember my problem, solution, action? Problem identified, solution given, problem accepted, solution accepted. It took one year by the time we really started using them. In December last year, in January this year, we ran out of lateral flow tests in the United Kingdom. And I put it to you, if we had started using them immediately, we could have avoided lockdowns two and three. Just imagine the hundreds of billions of pounds would have saved, the mental health, the operations that were canceled, the treatments that were canceled, uh, that we could have saved, we could have done. Let me give you another quick example. 24th of February. What happened on the 24th of February this year? Ukraine war started. Uh, I immediately remembered 
last year in April, May. Do you remember what happened in April, May last year in India? That horrible COVID second wave. India thought it got away with COVID. It was so bad, the Indian High Commissioner, Gayatri Sarkumar, said, Karan, I need your help. I need the CBI's help. India's run out of oxygen. You have all the trade associations. Do you have a, uh, a compressed air gas trade association? Of course, the British Compressed Air Association, member of the CBI. We set up a war room in the Indian High Commission in the Gandhi Hall. My chief of staff, Omar, and, and Peter Werner, Omar Singh, and I went there, worked with the High Commissioner team. We got cylinders across. We got generators across. We got concentrators across. Pfizer gave $60 million without even having their vaccine approved in yet. rent to gave £2 million. We gave help, 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 help. Help. And at the end of it all, she said, of all the high commissions and embassies around the world, the London High Commission helped the most. And she said, it's thanks to you and the CBI and business helping us out. You saved lives in India. <laughs> and I remember that. So when the war started on the 24th of February this year, I said, great, Britain's imposing sanctions straight away. British businesses have started to stop doing business with Russia straight away. I said, but what else can we do? The way we helped India. And I remember I'd met the Ukrainian ambassador, Vadim Prastaiko, and I asked my chief of staff, I said, Omar, phone the embassy, find out if the ambassador needs my help. This was on the weekend. He phoned two days after the war. The ambassador said, please come and see us on Monday. I went in on Monday, the 28th of March, of, uh, 20th of February, went up to the ambassador's office with him and his deputy. If I could have taken a picture of them a few days after the war had started, they hadn't slept, they were in a state of shock. And that's when I found out they told me the Russians thought they would walk in and take over our country and we would lay down our arms and hand over our country to them. They didn't realize we're going to fight and we need your help if we're going to fight. We've conscripted every male over the age of 18. For example, we have no ration packs, can you help? Within 24 hours, I convened a meeting of our 75 of our who's who British industry, Ambassador and I in the embassy, screened there, all of them saying, he said, tell them what help you need. And from the next day, we commandeered the Ministry of Defense's biggest supply of ration packs, one of our members, and to date we have sent three million ration packs across to help Ukrainian troops. <laughs> you fast forward a few weeks later, they said, supermarkets are being bombed, the food basket of the world is run out of food, we need our re your retailers, can we do food boxes, can we send out some food? Um, we again got the retailers together, we had the food minister from Kiev on the line, we had the ambassador, Warham and the CBI, and we've now sent out hundreds of thousands of food packs, enough food for a week, saving citizens' lives in Ukraine. This is what business can do. This is business as a force for good. And do you know what the Edelman Trust Barometer 2022 Business is the institution trusted the most. Isn't that amazing? When would that have happened in the past? And it's because of the way business has behaved. And that's why the title of my talk is Leading in Crises, The Zoroastrian Way. People didn't expect business to do these things. People expected the CBI to be a lobbying organization. They didn't expect them to help India in a time of crisis, help Ukraine in a time of crisis, and do all the good that we've done way beyond what people expect business to do. And so His Holiness the Pope, soon after the war started, said, in the name of God, I ask that this massacre stops. And I spoke at the memorial service of Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who was a fellow fellow of my college at Cambridge, Sydney Sussex. We used to address each other as fellow fellow, great man. And I read out a speech, an extract from a speech he made in 1988 when he addressed the apartheid government in South Africa, and it's very pertinent. And Desmond Tutu said this, you have already lost. Let us say so nicely, you have already lost. We are inviting you to come and join the winning side. Your cause is unjust. You're defending what is fundamentally indefensible because it is evil. It is evil without question. It is immoral. It is immoral without question. Therefore, you will bite the dust, and you will bite the dust comprehensively. And my most memorable day in Parliament in my 16 years, there are memorable days. The Queen comes once a year usually. It's a very grand occasion, state opening. We sit in our robes in the House of Lords. The House of Commons adjourn and come and join us, and it's the only joint sitting we have between the two houses, and the Queen addresses both houses. On the 8th of March, 
after the war had started. We adjourned the House of Lords. We went to the House of Commons. The House of Commons was sitting on their benches. We sat in the galleries. And President Zelensky addressed us live from Ukraine. And he ended his speech by quoting Shakespeare. And he said, to be or not to be. It has to be to be. And that's what they've been trying to do ever since. And I've been proud to have been able to try uh, and help. So I'm, I'm going to conclude my speech because my half an hour is now almost exactly up. Um, I can't conclude without mentioning Brexit. Um, we've left the European Union. We're trying to make the most of it. We're doing trade deals with Australia, with New Zealand. We've rolled over 69 trade deals with, with the European Union, have with other countries such as Mexico and Canada. And we're right in the middle of negotiating a free trade deal with India. Uh, the target is to get that done by Diwali. Um, so, I don't want to finish by not mentioning climate change. There's a lot of pressure with the crises we're going through, with inflation, with labor shortages, with um, energy crises around the world at the moment, with a war going on. People are saying, with climate change, let's park that for a while. We'll come back to it later. We can't afford it. I'm sorry. We need to double down on it more, because crises are temp temporary. Climate change is permanent. And, <laughs> and, and I spent one and a half out of the two weeks of COP26 um, in Glasgow, as president of CBI, I spoke at about 40 different events and meetings. And the highlight to me uh, of COP26 was not only was governments there and NGOs, but businesses were there. Businesses making commitments. 60% of the FTSE 100 have committed to net zero by 2050. But the highlight for me personally, I'm Chancellor of the University of Birmingham. And what started off as a PhD project um, ended up as the world's first retrofitted hydrogen-powered train, Hydroflex, in partnership with business, in partnership with government, up and running in Glasgow. Prince Charles was on the train, Boris Johnson was on the train. I chaired a meeting of transport leaders on the world's first retrofitted hydrogen-powered train. And that's what's possible, innovation in the midst of a pandemic that is world-changing. We also have to save the soil. We need 3 to 6 percent minimum organic content in soil that we need to push for. Um, and of course, finance. It, all this needs finance, and London is a world capital finance, as is New York. And wait for this. Talk about finance. Last year, there was a fintech review chaired by our one and only Zoroastrian Parsi, Ron Khalifa, who has now been knighted, and is Sir Ron Khalifa. So, a great friend of mine. Watch him. Um, and of course, uh, we also have Zara Mrolia, who is a hugely successful uh, fintech entrepreneur in, in the UK as well. The circular economy, let's not forget that, making beer, you, the, waste, the waste grain goes for cattle feed, the waste yeast goes to make marmite, the waste water is treated with effluent treatment plant, the waste carbon dioxide is recaptured and reused. The circular economy, we've got to continue. And finally, the Das Gupta review. If you haven't read it, read Professor Saparta Das Gupta's review that he wrote last year from the University of Cambridge, The Economics of Biodiversity. And he, ex he explains that nature is our most precious asset. How much more Zoroastrian can you get than that? And he talks about one million species that are now at threat of extinction. And Sir David Attenborough said, this report is the moral compass that we urgently need. And the master, former master of Trinity College, Cambridge, and my great friend and fellow crossbench peer, Lord Martin Rees, former president of the Royal Society, and current astronomer royal, one of the greatest scientists on this planet, he said recently, our planet has existed for 45 million centuries, but this is the first time in its history where one species, ours, can determine the biosphere's fate. So it's up to us uh, whether we make this happen or not. And how do I conclude this in an optimistic way? I mean, if you look around the world today, it's not particularly pleasant. It's doom and gloom all around. Most countries are about to face a recession. And it reminds me of a Harvard Business School case that I did on the Stockdale Paradox. How many of you have ever heard of the Stockdale Paradox? Can I see any hands up? Is there even one hand up? 
No? Read about the Stockdale paradox, about Admiral Stockdale, who was a prisoner of war in Vietnam, seven years, he survived, most of his comrades didn't. And when they analyzed it, I summarize it as this, he survived, he said, because the ones who were too optimistic and said we'd get home by Christmas would be disappointed, and they didn't make it. The ones who couldn't face the horror, the torture, didn't make it. He said he had the courage to face every single day and say, I know it's going to be a horrible day, I know it's going to be horror, and I've got to face that horror every single day. But I know that I'm going to come through in the end. And it's that combination of facing the reality and the horror, but having that optimism of the future that I think is the most important. And in terms of getting through crises, I've nearly lost my business three times. The three things that have seen me through is one, having a strong brand, Secondly, having the support of your family. My wife I met one year after I started. I would not be here talking to you without the support of my wife, who's been by my side for all these years. The support of your loyal team, your loyal team, if you've got a great team. And finally, integrity. And the world's Aston Chamber of Commerce, the motto is industry and integrity. And when I welcomed the Archbishop of Canterbury, to the Zoroastrian Center in Harrow, I made my speech, and he said, Lord Billamoria has used the word integrity three times, and the Zoroastrian Parsi community are renowned for their integrity. And he said the word integrity comes from the Latin and Greek words integra, integrum, that mean wholeness. You cannot practice integrity if you're fragmented in front of the light. You could only practice integrity if you're whole and complete. So brand, family and team support integrity, and we can get through any crisis. And then the last word is this, trust. Why have we been so successful? One of the main reasons is people trust Zoroastrians. People trust Zoroastrian Parsis. Narayan Murthy, when I met him for the first time, the founder of Infosys, the first thing he said to me is, I've never met a bad Parsi. And Professor Francis Fry gave a lecture during the pandemic, and I will summarize a one-hour lecture in one minute about trust. And she described trust as a triangle. To get trust, you have to be one point of the triangle authentic. We are very authentic. <laughs> I don't think it's more, more authentic than us. Secondly, you've got to have the logic. You've got to have the professional capability to deliver what you're promising, you're saying you're going to do. And the third is empathy. Are you in it for yourself or are you in it for them? So authenticity, logic, empathy, and you can get trust every time. And I think we've got all three of those as a community, which makes me very, very proud of all of us. So there we are. I end with our, my motto on my coat of arms, which is to aspire and achieve. And I add it to that, um, to aspire and achieve against all odds with integrity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very kind of you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karan, but please stay on the stage. You have a very important function to perform. May I please invite the two co-chairs of this Congress, Astat Klubwala and Arzan Wadia, along with Noshir Langrana, the co-chair of the Awards Committee. A very important item is about to unfold before you. Please. Noshir. So I'll hand over to Noshir for a few minutes, and we'll have the award ceremony. Thank you. We have unfinished business to complete today, and that's the uh, iconic Zarthusti Award to Cyrus Punawala. And uh, following the process, I would like to in invite Dinia Devetri to come to the stage to give the award to 
Lord Karen Billy Moria. But let me, let me first read what I have written for Cyrus Bunawala. A visionary India's vaccine king, he is the chairman of Punawala Group, which includes privately owned Serum Institute of India, India's top biotech company, and the world's largest vaccine manufacturer by number of doses produced and sold globally. In 1966, Punawala embarked on his journey with a humble beginning to establish Serum Institute of India with vision to make affordable vaccine which were unavailable in India at that time. Today, Serum Institute of world's largest producer of vaccine by number of doses, producing more than 1.5 billion doses a year of life-saving vaccines being used over 170 countries to combat infection from tetanus, measles, mumps, rubella, and the whooping cough. In 1994, Serum Institute was accredited by the World Health Organization, which allowed Serum Institute to export high-quality vaccine uh, to UN agencies. He has been recognized many, many times. Let me just, because of the time, just mention a few of the prestigious awards. He is a recipient of the highest honor, Dean's Medal from the prestigious John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, John Hopkins University for his exceptional leader in safeguarding and improving the world public health on May 21st, 2022 in Baltimore. Another one, honorary degree of Doctor of Science by University of Oxford, UK in 2019. And I'll mention one more, Honorary degree of Doctor of Human Letters from the University of Massachusetts, Boston, 2018. With that, I am asking Dinia Devetli to honor Cyrus Punawala with this award. Yes. Please. Uh, Cyrus Punawala has asked me to say a few words on his behalf. He is absolutely delighted to receive this award and is very sorry he's not here in person to receive it himself. And I was introduced to Cyrus by Rusi Dalal some years ago, well over a decade ago, and he said, Karen, you've got to meet Cyrus. You two must know each other. And he, I now count him as a very dear and trusted friend. Um, you've heard the official uh, citation, uh, but just to emphasize, this is not an overnight story. This is a story that is over half a century, an entrepreneurial story, a st story of sticking with it, striving, innovation, and even before, even before the pandemic, the Serum Institute of India was the largest vaccine manufacturer in the world with two out of three children in this world inoculated by uh, their vaccines. Um, and do you know, he told me many, many times, the Western countries are not interested in my vaccines and I do this through the developing world, but I'm doing it in an affordable way and I'm saving lives. He is being nominated for the Nobel Prize because he's saved over 30 million, 30 million lives. And during this pandemic, I don't know how many of you know this, but I, I sit exactly between Cyrus and Adar in age, so they're both my friends, <laughs> okay? Um, Adar was just accepting an award a few days ago and I was with him and he made the point and Cyrus made the point with the Indian High Commissioner recently at an event we had. Most people don't realize they took the risk in 2020 to manufacture 200 doses of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine even before it had been approved by anyone in the world. Can you imagine if that approval had never come through? And by the way, many vaccines approvals have still not come through. 
They took that risk and they would have had to destroy those 200 million vaccines. And because they took that risk, when it was approved, India was able to start exporting vaccines straight away to many countries, saving lives. And I get people coming to me, ambassadors, prime ministers saying, thank you in India uh, for getting us those vaccines so quickly. And it's only because of Cyrus and other taking that risk to do that right up front. So, so now Cyrus, Poonawala and other Serum Institute of India are well established. They've exported, I helped them export 5 million doses to the UK. The medical research MHRA of the UK flew across to their factory and approved it within weeks, within days. If you see their factory, it's one of the most impressive factories in the world, and I love factories. It's a bit like making beer, by the way. There's a, there's a process. There are bottles that go down a production line. But it's a most impressive factory. They deserve every success that they're having at the moment. And he is by now, by far, the most successful pharmaceutical entrepreneur in the whole world, without exaggeration. So, congratulations, Cyrus Poonawala. And in my speech, I mentioned Cyrus the Great. Well, we have our very own Cyrus the Great, who is conquering the world today. Thank you.